Good morning, everyone, and very welcome to our first collaboration webinar um, this morning, e Everything EMC Between Keysight Technologies and YIC Technologies. So for those of you guys who haven't met me before, um, I am Cornell Roberts, and I am the Marketing Manager for YIC Technologies. And today, I will just give you a brief introduction on Keysight and YIC technologies. Now, I'm sure none of you need an introduction to Keysight, but because of the purpose of this webinar, I'm going to give it to you anyway. So, Keysight Technologies is a leading technology company that helps enterprises, service providers, and governments accelerate innovation and connect and secure the world. Keysight solutions optimize networks and bring electronic products to the market faster at a lower cost with offerings from design simulation to prototype validation to manufacturing test to optimization in networks and cloud environments. Customers span the worldwide communications ecosystem, aerospace and space, automotive, energy, semiconductor, and general electronics in the end market. So Keysight generated uh, 4.3 billion um, in the fiscal year of 2019. So if you guys need any more information on Keysight, you can visit their website, uh, which is keysight.com. Now I'll move on to YIC technology. So YIC Technologies were formed when we took over the EMC EMI business from MScan. We are a European company. We have our office, our main office in the United Kingdom, um, but our manufacturing takes place in Canada. We have our own team at YIC, but we work very closely with our partner network, which gives us a global presence. So, we help achieve EMC, EMI, first time, every time. We have a complete product range to help you rapidly diagnose and solve your EMC, EMI problems. We have a product range um, which will help you solve the problems with real-time emission analysis without having to leave your desk. So, the uh, product and standard and what we try to achieve is accelerate your time to market with your product, increase your designer productivity and also the most important one is to reduce the project costs altogether. So our two presenters today is Pierre-Yves Marcelin from Keysight and Professor Arturo Mediano from the HF Magic Lab at the University of Saragossa. Professor Arturo is the founder of the HF Magic Lab, a specialized laboratory for bubble at the University of Saragossa. We have the teaching profession uh, from 1992. And he focuses on the RF and EMC applications. His main focus is 5G and EMC applications with measurement experience on signal analyzers, signal generators, receivers, and oscilloscopes. So if you have any questions through the duration of this webinar, uh, please pop it in the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and we will aim to answer all these questions at the end of the webinar. Um, many thanks for your participation today. We are really excited about this webinar. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Pierre from Keysight Technologies for the first part of the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Cornell. 
Um, can you hear me well? We can hear you, yes. Okay, great. There can you are. Hello. Can you see me? Yeah, great. Hello, everyone. Um, so I will share my screen. So can you see it now? Yes, you just need to make it full screen. There we go. All good to go, okay. Pierre. Great. Okay, thank you. So hello and welcome, everyone. So I am Pierre-Yves Marcelin from France. I'm application engineer for Keysight. And as the Cornell told you, I'm specialized on the RF signal analyzers, signal generators, and all the, the instruments that we can use for RF measurements. Um, today, I'll talk about uh, EMC measurements or EMI measurements. Uh, what are the fundamentals in terms of measurements, in terms of testing measurement instruments, and uh, what key site can provide to, to do that. So please don't hesitate to, to stop me if you have any question or write, write it directly in the chat. Um, so here is the agenda we will cover for the next 30 minutes. So we'll talk briefly about EMC basics for some of you who, who, who don't know what, what is EMC or EMI. Then we'll talk also about the traditional methods of EMC spectrum analysis. Then we'll move to the modern EMC receivers for, for a few minutes. And then I'll talk about the evolution of speed, the time domain scan capability, which has been added on the receivers in the last few years. And then I'll, I'll do a, a quick live demo with some instruments I have here with me. So let's talk about EMC. So I don't know if every one of you is, is familiar with those concepts or not. That's why I will just remind you uh, what, what EMC means. Uh, so EMC is the acronym of electromagnetic uh, compatibility. It is defined as the ability of uh, an electronic device to work in its electromagnetic environment without uh, introducing some disturbances to other devices in, in the same environment. So EMC contains both EMI and EMS concepts. So EMI uh, refers to electromagnetic interference. So that means that every device is not supposed to generate excessive energy into this into its environment and EMS uh, refers to the susceptibility of a device to, to remain in a good working status in any electromagnetic environment so in the next few slides we'll, we'll talk a, a bit more about EMI uh, specifically so what is EMI so another definition here so EMI as I told you means electromagnetic interferences so I, I put here a few examples of, of devices that may generate some excessive EMI emissions. So, for example, rotating machines are generating some interferences and everything basically containing a motor is a potential source of EMI. So those emissions can be generated either by radiation, so that means that a device that would be next to this emission could be disturbed or those emissions can be conducted. So in that case, that would generate some interferences on the electrical network, meaning that everything connected to, to this network could be disturbed. So the, the, the definition has been added here basically, and I added some details like the, the regulations. Uh, so there are some regulations, some uh, regulators that have set some limits some requirements that any electronic device has to be compliant with. So some of you may know CISPR or FCC. There are also many other regulators, but the, the main ones are maybe here. And the regulations also set some methodologies, some test methods that everyone has to take care when we do EMI measurements. The test houses also have to be compliant with those measurements and uh, the, the receivers to the, the instruments that we use have to be compliant with that. So I will detail uh, a bit more in the next few slides, but please remind you that uh, all of those definitions and everything that we will talk about is referred to those regulations like CISPR. 
Um, so hopefully the, the good news is that those emissions can be captured by spectrum analyzer or a receiver, and that's what, what we will talk about in the, in the next slide. So let's talk about uh, um, over a quick overview of, of spectrum analysis. Uh, so the, first, the question is, what is spectrum analyzer? So spectrum analyzer first is a receiver, only a receiver, passive receiver. So that means that it it won't act on the signal itself. That won't generate anything. It's just a way to to look at the signal with a receiver. So I won't spend too much detail on on the block diagram. I, I just added here a few details uh, of what you can find in the the literature about spectrum analyzers. But the principle is the same than the the super heterodyne receiver. So. Some of you may already have heard this acronym or this term. So it's like the old radios were working. And for some of you who have some old AM radios or FM radios inside, it, it works like that. It, it's the same same way of working. And the, the goal here is to display measure and measure amplitude versus frequency. So uh, basic spectrum analyzer or the analog spectrum analyzer is a device that will only do that, display amplitude versus frequency. And this is what we will look on the, the screen, mainly for EMI measurement. And you can see inside that the principle is that we are mixing inside two, two frequencies, so the one that, that is coming from your device or from the air, and another one which is coming from a local oscillator, and that frequency mixing then comes inside an IF stage, and we are doing a, a kind of process, and then we are displaying the, the frequency on, on the screen. And this is how it works. So for some of you who, who would like to know more about that, you can find some some literature on, and many more information on, on, on the Keysight website or even on, on Wikipedia, we, we can find many information about that. So this is how it works, a spectrum analyzer. Uh, then I'll, I'll move to the other slide, which is EMC receivers. So an EMC receiver, in fact, is a spectrum analyzer with a bit more capabilities, and we will detail it uh, on that slide. So first, an EMC receiver is something that is fully compliant uh, with the regulators like CISPR 16 or even some other regulators. And everything inside, all the components and all we implemented has to be compliant with that. So for example, in, a, in an EMC receiver, you can find additional features like the built-in emitter or some EMI detectors that have been implemented. So this is the kind of thing that require a bit of, of processing and additional features inside. So this is uh, because it is different than the spectrum analyzer here. And this is one one main differentiator. You can also find many other hardware uh, inside, like the notch filters or some um, pre filters, bank, bank of filters, like the one I added here. So this directly comes from the block diagram of the receiver, which is here. And you can you can see that there are many filters inside that have been designed, uh, especially for EMI and scanning bands that have been designed and, and set by the, the CISPR or other regulators. So this is why the, the EMC receiver is a bit more complex than the traditional spectrum analyzer. We had many more things inside. Um, and there are also some specifications that have been designed and especially uh, that have been implemented for CISPR, like the input VSWR, so the, the voltage uh, sending wave ratio at the input of the receiver has to be compliant with some values that have been set by the regulator. So those are the, the main difference. Um, I will talk about the detectors in the next slide. Maybe some of you may have a question about that. So we'll talk about the detectors in the, in the next few slides. And um, yeah, just remind that hopefully uh, an EMC receiver can still be used and has a normal spectrum analyzer. So even if you are just interested to do some basic spectrum analysis, you can still use a receiver for that because it will disable all these filters if you don't need it and 
etc. So that's it for, for the receiver. Uh, yeah, sorry for the animations. Okay. So let's talk now about detectors. So this is something I introduced in, in the past slide. Uh, so what is a, a detector? So during a, a spectrum scan, when you observe the, the traits, you can look at with different detectors and have different traces displayed at, at the same time on the receiver. So the first detector that you can use is the, the peak detector, which is the one who, which all, always brings the, the highest emission level on, on the display compared to the, the quasi-peak or the EMI average detector. So it's it's common to first run a scan with the peak detector as an initial scan because it is the, the fast sweep and if the emission is within the, the limit line, then you should be comfortable that you can also pass the limit test with the other two detectors. So that's basically the first detector we set when we are doing a, a, an EMC scan. And, and then you can see that there are also other detectors that you can use like the quasi-peak detector. So for some of you who, who are doing some EMI or EMC measurements, quasi-peak detector is also widely used. Uh, so it's coming from, in fact, the, the CISPR that defined this detector. And it has been used, in fact, to, to compare what we originally uh, heard when we were hearing at the AM radio and when there were some interferences, uh, subjective annoyance, like it is defined here, the, the quasi-peak is here to like compare this, uh, this fact and what we heard when we had some interferences. And it, it has been used uh, since that for many, many EMC tests. And it's like a an, an way between the peak detector and the average detect detector. So, you can see here the, the comparison where you are using the peak detection uh, with a, a pulse signal. The, the peak detection will always display the highest level, whereas the quasi-peak detector would be in between of the average and the peak detector. So it, it is really uh, related to the, the way and the pulse repetitive frequency you are measuring. And yeah, it's like, when we heard the ARM with you, the, the more there were some interferences and the more it was disruptive. So this is how it works uh, inside. And this is the kind of thing you can you can set on the receiver. So you can enable the peak detector or the quasi-peak detector depending on the, the scan you want to run. And on the modern receivers, you can also now choose the three different, up to three different detectors in, in the same time to compare those detectors and the effect on your signal. So that's it for the detectors. Uh, I will talk then about the modern now uh, methods that we are using for, for doing EMC measurements. So here are the, the main setups that we use when we measure EMI emissions or EMC uh, emissions. So we will detail those setups in, in the next few slides, but this is just an, an overview here. So the setup on the left is for radiated emission. So here we are monitoring the EUT, means uh, emission on the test. So it's basically coming from, from the device you are testing. And the emissions come from that device. And then we are adding an antenna inside the setup. The antenna is represented here. And this antenna is capturing the, the signal coming from the, the device and then uh, with the cable, we are connecting it to the spectrum analyzer or to the receiver, and then we are analyzing that on the screen. We will detail that, that setup uh, in the next slide. And on the right, you, you can see the, the conducted setup for conducted emissions. So in that case, we are not using any antenna, but instead a uh, LISN. So LISN means a Line Impedance Stabilization Network. We will have more information also in the next slides. And this is basically a filter, but we, we will see that then in the next slide. So let's first talk about radiated setups. So here is here are some setups that are commonly used for emission testing. So we can use some, for example, semi-anechoic chambers, like the, the ones that are here on the top. So that's very convenient for 
small devices or for pre-compliance testing where, where we don't have much space. And uh, you can also use the wider anechoic chamber, which, which is a well-shielded room with absorbers uh, on all the sides of the room. So this is usually used for, for compliance testing. And during the emission, uh, radiated emission testing, we are using some antennas. So this is something that CISPR is also specifying. The antenna types for its products are well-defined. For example, when testing consumer electronics, the frequently used antenna could be the, the biconical antenna or the log periodic, depending on, on the, the frequency. And testing uh, military electronics, uh, for example, is using own antennas for, for another example. So those are uh, some examples of antennas that are displayed here. And you can see that uh, depending on the setup you are using and depending on the, the standards you are measuring, uh, this antenna has to be placed at three or 10 meters depending on, on the setups. And then we have the emissions of the device directly uh, displayed on the, on the screen of the receiver. Uh, note that we also have to take care of that antenna uh, when we are doing the measurement. So I mean, that we have to enter the correction factors of the antenna into the receiver. So this is something that also can be done now in the, the modern receivers. And we can also add the, the cable loss. We can also add the, all, all the passive things that have some losses inside the, the chain can be added in, in the receiver so that the measurements you are doing is, is the one from the device and not from all the chain you are putting in, in between. Let's talk now about the conducted emission testing. So here is an example of a conducted test setup, for example. So as you can see, there are several items. So the first one uh, could be an isolation transformer. So it, it provides a safe isolation from for the operator. Then you can find a EMI filter to, to provide a, a clean AC power to, to the LISN. So the LISN is here on the, on the setup. And here are a few definitions here of the LISN. So for some of you who are doing conducted emissions, you probably know all those kind of things. But for those who don't know that, uh, the LISN, in fact, is a device that will isolate the power mains from, from the equipment and the test, uh, because the, the power mains can, can be dangerous for your device if you plug it directly. In, inside the spectrum analyzer, so we have to isolate the power uh, so that it won't come inside the spectrum analyzer. And then the LISN also provides an isolation from the noise generated by the device itself. It, it will prevent this noise to, to be coupled on the power mains, and instead it, it, it will be uh, directed to the spectrum analyzer or to the receiver so that we will be able to, to measure those emissions on the spectrum analyzer. So here is um, uh, an example of a, a diagram of, of, yeah, like a schematic of, of, the, of the LISN and what you can find inside. So you can see that it's like a, a multi-filter that will provide all those isolations between the devices. And it is also something that is specified in the, the, the CISPR standards or for other regulations. And then after the LISN, you will find a limiter uh, sometimes, which will prevent excessive input power to, that would damage the, the, the front end of the spectrum analyzer. And at the end, you will find the spectrum analyzer or the receiver that will capture and analyze the, the interfering signals and, and determine if, if it meets the, uh, the requirements of the standards. And as I told you, sometimes the limiter can be built inside the, the receiver itself. Uh, yeah, okay, animations here. I will talk now about the evolution of, of speed that has been implemented in, in the modern receivers. So it is a concept that some of you may already know, but I, I will talk here about the, the time sweep that it takes when you are doing an EMC scan. So for some of you who are making EMI measurements, you know that the time it takes to measure all the frequency range with 
different detectors and uh, sometimes different antenna position with some predefined resolution bandwidth may be very long, so it can take several hours to do an entire measurement with all the, the required setups. So the measurement times essentially come from the receiver itself because it has some uh, detectors with predefined uh, dwell time and some predefined resolution bandwidth that have been set by, by the standards. And this sweep can become very long when you add uh, some very low resolution bandwidth with quasi-peak detectors, for example. So that's why we introduced a um, few years ago the, the time domain scan capabilities on our receivers. So in fact, uh, in that new way of scanning the, the bandwidth, the receiver uses a, a digitizer inside. So instead of sweeping point to point like it was doing in, in the past, we are now using a, a white digitizer uh, that has up to 350 megahertz of bandwidth now on the modern receivers. And it takes much more data in the same time than before. So we are in using the fast Fourier transform method. So we are acquiring a time domain uh, measurement data, and then we are converting it to the frequency domain. And that uh, method uh, enables us to do very fast scans compared to the, the past. So when you are doing many setups with different positions of antenna, this kind of thing, I will show you that the time it takes is, is much more uh, efficient now and you can save uh, some hours uh, when you are doing a measurement with, with that capability. So this is the purpose of my next slide, I think. Yes, so this is an example of uh, an automotive setup, but it, it could be uh, the same for many other standards and many other devices. So typically for ear radiated emission setup uh, with an antenna, you have to do a different antenna position uh, so, for example, the horizontal or vertical uh, polarization, so that requires two different scans. And sometimes you have to do that at different distances, so one, three, ten meters, for example. So you have to multiply the number of scans you are doing. And if you are doing that uh, with a quasi-peak detector, for example, like on, on, on that example here, on the CISPR band from 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz, with a quasi-peak detector and one second of dwell time uh, with the normal mode that, that would take up to nine hours. So for some of you who, who have some old receivers or spectrum analyzer uh, with the, the normal step scan, you know that it can, it can take many, many hours. And this is painful when you are doing different setups because if you multiply that by, by four, for example, if you have four antenna positions, you can imagine that it will take uh, many, many hours. And with the, the time domain scan, the, the, the concept I introduced in the past slide, you can see that the time it takes is reduced to less than one minute. So this is very impressive. And uh, the, the difference is amazing when you are doing this time domain scan capability. And I also introduced here an accelerated time domain scan and, we, and I will show you more details on the next slide, but this is something that Keysight introduced uh, recently on the new receiver uh, that we have on the portfolio. And this accelerated time domain scan is even much more performance now than the, the normal time domain scan, I would say. So let's talk about that, that new accelerated time domain scan. So this is something we introduced here on the, the PXC receiver, which is the high performance receiver for, for, from Keysight. So it's an instrument that has been released um, less than two years ago now. Uh, you can see that it has different frequency ranges depending on what you need. It is fully compliant with uh, all the regulators and all the EMC standards like, like CISPR and FCC or military standards. And uh, we introduced on that receiver a wideband digitizer that will allow uh, the measurement uh, to, to be very fast uh, instead of using the normal time domain scan, we are using here uh, much more data and just digitizing much more things so that the time it takes to, to do the sweep is, is very short. Uh, you can see also that 
we it has uh, some very good uh, specifications like the sensitivity which is up to minus 169 dBm per Hertz at 1 gigahertz. So thanks to a new uh, design inside with LNAs and many other things, we are able to, to measure uh, some signals up to this, this value. And uh, it has also a built-in emitter and, and many, other, many other things. So if you need additional details, we, we can send you some, some data sheets about that instrument. Um, I think then, I have a video about this time domain scan accelerating mode that I introduced. So this example has been done on the CISPR band uh, CD, so 30 megahertz to one gigahertz using a quasi-peak detector with one second of dwell time and 120 kilohertz of resolution bandwidth. So for some of you who already did that measurement with a normal receiver, I would say, you know that it can take uh, several hours. and here, for example, on the left, I have a video with the standard TDS, so the standard uh, SFT scan that some of you may already know that can take, in this example, up to 46 seconds. So that's already impressive compared to the, the previous method, but you can see that it, it, be, it, yeah, it becomes longer at the end because the, this is a logarithm sweep, and yeah, it will take 46 seconds. I won't wait until the end. And on the right side, we have now the wideband time domain scan or accelerated time domain scan that has been implemented on the PXC. And you will see that the time it takes is really impressive. So yeah, almost six seconds. So that's uh, quicker than the normal time domain scan. And this is something now that is available on, on our receiver. So for some of you who have some concerns about the, the time it takes. Here is a, a, a quick example, and you can see that it's amazing. Um, let's talk now about another receiver that Keysight introduced uh, very recently. So if, I think it has been introduced this month. Uh, maybe some of you may already know the MXC. So this, this was the, the previous receiver from Keysight N9038A. It has been introduced that version a few years ago, I don't remember, but now we introduced the P version um, with the same design, same hardware design than the MXA, MXA, uh, sorry, MXCA, but with some additional features like an increased analysis bandwidth. Uh, also, the time domain scan is available in, in, in this receiver, and it has also very good sensitivity, a bit lower than than the, the, the one, sorry, uh, the window here. Uh, yeah, a bit lower than the one uh, from, from the PXC, but you can see that it's still very good at one gigahertz, and it is fully compliant also with the, the latest standards. Uh, so it is now the, the mid-range receiver for, for from Keysight portfolio, and depending on, on the, the performance you need, we can provide now two different receivers. Um, just yeah, last slide about instruments. Um, sorry. Yeah, last slide about instruments. So, for some of you who are doing only pre compliance measurements, we don't need some receivers, but only a spectrum analyzer. Kishai can also provide a, a wide range of instruments. So, here is the, the portfolio of signal analyzers. So, you can see that we have several models depending on the performance you need. So you, the more you are going on the right, the more the spectrum analyzer will have some good performances like sensitivity, like phase noise. So UXA, for example, are a very high performance spectrum analyzer for wideband analysis and many other things. But for basic EMI uh, measurements, a CXA or EXA can, can be already very good. And it, it really depends on the performance you need. So if you need additional details, please please contact us and we can send you more information about that. So I will then finish my presentation with a live demo. So I have here a setup that I will, I will show you the screen. So can you see now uh, my screen, which is uh, an EMI receiver? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So 
this is an instrument which is connected here with me um, and I can access with with the, the Windows uh, remote desktop connection. So that, that is something that is implemented uh, in standard on the instrument. And I use the signal generator uh, directly connected to this uh, spectrum analyzer to generate some signals that you can see here. And I run a scan here in my instrument. You can see that it is now sweeping and it, it, it has displayed the different uh, signals that are displayed on, on a red ear. So I added a, a limit line just before running that scan. I don't know if you will see because uh, yeah, the, the resolution might, might be uh, a bit low, but there is a, a yellow line here that is representing the, the limit line from the CISPR I added. And uh, if the, the, the signal uh, is upper that limit, it, it will then be displayed as red. And then if you are doing a search method here, you can see that the analyzer is able to measure all the signals that are upper the, the limit. And it can display those signals inside the table here that is representing all the identified signals with a peak detector. We can also add, if we want, some quasi-peak and average measurements if needed. And you can see that here in red, there is the delta uh, value that is representing the, the delta between the limit and the amplitude of the signals. So this is something that uh, is that, that Keysight is providing inside all the EMI receivers and in the spectrum analyzers as an option. We can provide that EMI application that will enable you to do uh, EMI measurements with all the predefined limits. Uh, so I can show you quickly that we have many built-in limits inside that you can recall and add on your measurements. So here I used one of the European 55022 uh, standards, but we have also many other standards that have been uh, in, uh, implemented inside the spectrum analyzer and you have many other limits that you can use. You can also add your own limits by, by creating a CSV file and importing it inside the spectrum analyzer. And you can see that we also implemented some preset standards corresponding to, to CISPR band. So in that case, I used the, the CISPR CD band here, 30 megahertz, one gigahertz, but you have also all the other bands defined. And the application also provides the capability to generate a report directly from the instrument. So if you, if you need it, you can here save uh, the measurement and, and do it with a measurement report where you can add a header, customer logo description, everything you want. And it will have the screen capture and the measurement data inside. And you can save that directly in HTML or PDF on a USB key or on the spectrum itself. So this is the kind of thing we can provide for pre-compliance or compliance testing. And here I use the spectrum analyzer MXA uh, for that measurement. So I won't be able to show you the accelerated time domain scan, but if we had uh, this PXC receiver with high performance, I could have used here inside the scan menu an, an accelerated time domain scan here. So you just have to press one button and I could have run uh, this accelerated scan with quasi peak detector code. Here I can show you, because uh, I'm using the, the, the peak detector. So the, the, the scan uh, is taking less than, than one second, but if, if you are changing the settings inside the scan table, so you can here enter inside the scan table and instead of using a dwell time on 6.7 micro, I can use a one second, but uh, oh, it has been limited. Maybe I should change the detector somewhere. You can see that we have the, the end and the control on, and on everything inside the scan table and you can run the measurement on different ranges and then change the resolution bandwidth, the dwell time, the, the, the attenuation, even range by range. So this is very agile. And you can change uh, whatever you want during the, the scan. And I think that it, it's really powerful for EMI measurement. Um, I think I, I did everything. I can maybe run the scan with 
the, the, the dwell time. So here I increased the dwell time to 247 milliseconds, just for example. And you can see here that, that the scan has begun, but it will take a long time. And some of you already know that because the more you are adding some dwell time and the more the scan will take long time. So I won't uh, wait until the end, but here is how the, the normal spectrum analyzer or normal step scan receiver would do. And you can imagine that if I run that with the accelerated time domain scan, it, it would have been already done if I add the, this feature on my instrument. Um, I think I'm okay with the presentation. So I will then uh, give the end to, to Arturo or the, the the next part. And if you have any question, just add it inside the slide. And I think at the end, we, we should have a, a quick Q&A together. All right. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, and we'll hand over to uh, Professor Arturo now. Hello, Cornell. Can you listen to me? We can hear you loud and clear. OK, let me share the screen because uh, I hear. OK. Uh, uh, here, so let me know. You can see the screen. It's OK? It's still coming through. Yes, I can see the screen. This is Excellent. the presentation, right? Excellent. Good morning. Good thank morning. you, Cornell, for the presentation. And thank you, Pierre, for, for the first part of this uh, webinar. I am very happy to be uh, sharing this time with all of you. And uh, we will spend some additional uh, time uh, for debugging EMI problems with in the near field. Uh, I will be using some near field uh, tools, and I hope you will enjoy this, this webinar. I'm working from many, many time ago with uh, YAC Technologies. It's, a company specialized in the near field scanning, and this is the first time we work with uh, Keysai. So I hope you will enjoy this uh, experience. Okay, so let's start with the first idea. Remember, like uh, if you are interested in EMI and EMC, you are designing or manufacturing electronic products, you uh, are focused in this situation. The idea is that you have some kind of victim that is receiving the uh, problem, the, the energy that is coming from some circuit of some uh, product. Uh, this energy can be created by what, uh, by what we call an intentional transmitter. I mean uh, a wireless system, for example, a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi uh, radio uh, frequency system or a telephone or something like that. All the people know that these uh, uh, circuits uh, radiate energy to the environment because many people know that these uh, uh, devices uh, have an internal antenna to do this uh, work. But uh, many people is not uh, very uh, familiar with the idea that many times we have unintentional transmitters. We have hidden antennas, we have uh, hidden transmitters inside of any electronic product in automotive business, home appliances, audio systems. If you are working at low frequencies or you are working at high frequencies, part of the energy that is in your product is able to arrive to the victim. So remember, if you study this uh, problem from uh, the theoretical point of view, you will find in many books that the problem is uh, related with the idea of uh, experimenting a culprit or finding a culprit. We have a victim and we have some kind of coupling mechanism. The most difficult part in the uh, troubleshooting of EMI and EMC is uh, to find how is the coupling mechanism between the culprit and the victim. It's through the air, it's through the cables, it's through the chassis, it's conducted, it's non-conducted, it's the crosstalk. There is a lot of possibilities and typically uh, it, this is not an easy task for the designer. This is what happened when you go to the lab you try to pass some kind of test, conducted radiated emissions. Pierre has been explaining this idea very well. And uh, for example, in the picture, you can see a conducted emissions result from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. And you can see how are the emissions over some kind of limit in some specific regulation in peak, quasi peak or in average mode. This product cannot be uh, sold. And then we need to go inside of a product to solve the problem. 
Many times we try to solve the problem with a filter or shielding. This is not the best solution. Filtering or shielding try to go to the coupling mechanism to reduce the coupling mechanism, uh, typically with filters for conducted emissions and with shielding for non-conducted uh, for non-conducted coupling. Uh, what we usually uh, try to recommend is to try to find where is the culprit, of, where is the source of the signal. If you find the source of the signal, you can uh, reduce the emissions uh, for any kind of cable, any kind of enclosure, any kind of slots, apertures, or any kind of part of your system. So this is because finding the culprit is so effective and so important. Uh, I will try to do some uh, demos working with nuclear probes. Uh, in the debugging process, uh, we try to go close to the circuit under test instead of uh, this kind of test where in radiated emissions we are at three meters, 10 meters, something like that. We are in what we call the far field. Or for example, when we are uh, measuring uh, conducted emissions, we are uh, analyzing how is the noise we are injecting in the power supply cable. But then when we try to find in the circuit where is the energy created, we can use uh, near field probes. We have two different near field probes. One near field probe is specialized for uh, magnetic fields. What is a near field probe for magnetic field? It's very easy. Take a piece of coax cable. You can remove the plastic at the end of the cable and you can uh, create this small loop here. If you create a very, very small loop, what happened? You will be able to pick up very small energy through the coupling of magnetic field lines through this loop. Uh, this is good or is bad? It depends. If you are interested in a very high uh, um, uh, spatial resolution, this is very good because with a very, very small loop, you will be able to find that the origin of the problem is some specific trace or some specific component in your uh, design. But if the signal that you are picking up is very, very small, you will need some kind of preamplifier or some kind of very uh, high dynamic range instrument to see the signal. For example, one spectrum analyzer and perhaps with one oscilloscope is very difficult to see the signal uh, included with the noise. What we can do to uh, pick up more noise, losing some kind of uh, physical uh, spatial resolution, is to increase the size of the loop. This is another possibility. Then, with when we go from a small size to a bigger size, uh, uh, you will uh, um, obtain some additional effect. Typically, the bandwidth of the probe will be reduced. Bigger probes are lower in bandwidth, uh, so you will be able to pick up less uh, with less efficiency, very high frequencies. We will have resonances, we have capacitive effects in the uh, construction of this probe. Another different uh, technique is to uh, take several turns in your probe. No? So, what we have is to uh, take one, two, three, four, I don't know, different number of turns. So we will be able to have more uh, voltage at the output of the probe, but this kind of uh, turns will introduce additional parasitic interwinding capacitance and the uh, self-resonant frequency of the probe will go down. But it's very effective if the signals you want to pick up are not very, very, very high. I mean, lower than I don't know, um, 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz, something like that. What you will find in commercial probes is that the loop is shielded for electric fields. Because in the previous uh, probes, this uh, small wire you are using to pick up a magnetic field lines is sensitive in some way for to electric field uh, from your circuit. To minimize this effect, we can increase the size of the shield around the loop, like you can see here. And at the end, we add some kind of gap. And we connect the internal connect conductor, the inner conductor to the shield. So we are closing the loop. The loop is exactly the same for the magnetic field. But for electric field, we have some kind of Faraday cage around the loop. And electric fields will not be so effective. Typically, this gap is not here in a commercial probes. This, typically, this gap, instead of here, we can go here. If you, we connect the silt at this point, then there is no magnetic or electric field pickup. The gap, typically, is in the middle of the loop, 
So we have a symmetrical structure. So you can try these uh, probes in your laboratory very easily, and sometimes they work very, very well. In electric field probes, the idea is again to go to the end of your coax cable, and you put a very small part of the inner conductor out of the shield. Then any kind of electric field probe, uh, electric field lines, will go to your small step, to, a small, to the small piece of inner uh, conductor. If you have the uh, need to find the specific source of the electric field with a very high spatial resolution, the idea is that this small uh, tip must be very, very small. If you are interested in picking up more signal, uh, but you are not in the need of very high spatial resolution, you will find that introducing a small a metallic bowl at the end of the probe, or for example, some kind of metal plate at the end of the uh, inner conductor, you will have more surface to pick up electric field lines. Remember, more signal in the output of the probe, you will be able to see the signal very well, including in oscilloscopes, but the idea is that you will have less resolution especially. Typically, these probes are covered with some kind of resin or some kind of plastic. So uh, in the process of doing some kind of uh, uh, scanning, uh, sniffing process through the uh, PC board, you will not be creating source circuits. So what can you do with these kind of probes? What you can do, for example, is to scan your PC board, looking so for some kind of aggressive uh, structure, I don't know, DC-DC converters, digital clock lines, some kind of power electronic uh, switching activity. If you have very high DISDTs, this is the good probe to use. Magnetic near field probes. Magnetic near field probes are uh, sensitive to uh, changes in the current that is going through the traces or the wires in your system. If you are interested in the voltage in DVDT, the electric field probe is the good uh, probe to use. No? For example, in the node of the back converter, DC-DC converter, you will find very useful to use the electric field probe to find how is the change of voltage with time. But if you are interested in the magnetic field around the coil of this back com uh, converter, the idea is to use a magnetic field probe to pick up the magnetic field lines that are uh, created by the change in current in this component. There is a lot of possibilities to work with near field probes in your PCBs. Additionally, you can put the near field probe close to cables, so you will be able to measure differential or common mode currents, and you can use the near field probes for finding leakage in enclosures. Remember that uh, uh, with the only exception of low frequency magnetic fields, very low frequency magnetic fields, 50, 60 hertz, 100, 120 hertz, uh, when you go at frequencies higher than some uh, tens or hundreds of kilohertz, the, the material you are using in the enclosure is not so important. You can use aluminum, you can use steel, you can use copper, I don't know, different metallic materials. And the problem with uh, uh, enclosures is the leakage you will be creating with the slots, apertures, or in the areas where cables go in and out of your product. So it's very interesting to use a new field probe to find this, uh, this kind of um, uh, holes or this kind of uh, parts of your system that uh, have leakage. Let me show you how I can uh, measure with near field probes in this way. If we're going to the scanner, let me remove this screen. Okay, let me remove. And here is the setup for my um, demonstration. Let me remove this screen now. And what you can see here is a typical near field probe that is uh, a commercial. No, uh, Here you can see two different loops. They are magnetic field um, uh, probes. These uh, loops are sealed for electric field, and they are in different sizes, so I can obtain more signal with the big loop with less spatial resolution, and very small, uh, or, or a, a small loop, you can find in the market very, very, very small loops, so you are able to identify the activity in some specific PCB trace or some specific SMD component. So with a, a small loop, I am more especially uh, resolutive. So the idea is that the output of the probe is a voltage that you uh, send to the instrument you will be using for measuring the spectrum analyzer, 
the oscilloscope, the EMI receiver, the instrument you want, typically with a 50 ohms coax cable and terminating at the end with a 50 ohms termination. What I have in the, in the table is a Philfox instrument. In the Philfox, you have the possibility to work in different modes. Uh, the screen of the instrument is here in another window, so it's easier for you to see how is the result of the measurements. In the uh, field Fox, you, you, we, you can work with uh, different modes, for example, the TDR mode for testing. This is useful for signal integrity or for cable analysis. You can you work with a network analyzer, very useful to find resonances, to find the response of filters, things like that. Or for example, the spectrum analyzer. I will be using the spectrum analyzer mode so like with any spectrum analyzer, we have two important things to set at the beginning. One is the reference level and the other is the frequency range of interest. Now I'm going up to 18 gigahertz by default is the maximum frequency of the unit I have on top of the table. I am not interested in frequencies up to uh, um, uh, 18 um, uh, gigahertz. So let's reduce, let's go to the menu of frequency and then we can specify uh, the uh, frequency with the center and a span. I mean, I specify what frequency is in the center and how is the frequency range around this center that I am interested in analyzing. Or I can specify the start frequency and the stop frequency. Let's go to a start frequency and let's introduce here, for example, 10 megahertz. Then we go to the stop frequency and let's see, for example, 150 megahertz 150 megahertz you can see here the uh, noise i have in the instrument nothing is connected oh sorry secret i have connected the cable let me remove the cable so nothing is connecting now to the instrument so this is the noise level here uh, for this setup for this specific setup and i am going to uh, specify the resolution bandwidth pierre was uh, talking about the resolution bandwidth i can specify here for example, a resolution bandwidth of uh, 2 megahertz. Let me put 2 megahertz. If you put a very small resolution bandwidth, you will have more resolution in frequency, but the sweep will be uh, slower. This is the advantages of the uh, real-time spectrum analysis. No, But in this instrument, I am uh, sweeping with this resolution bandwidth. If I in increase the resolution bandwidth, what I get is a faster sweep. Uh, but you will see the effect in the signal I am able to see. So uh, let's uh, connect with a coax cable, a 50 ohms coax cable, the output of the near field probe to my instrument. Remember, what you are looking at in the screen now is the activity in the uh, near field probe uh, coming from the uh, variable magnetic field around the loop. Now the uh, the, is, uh, the loop is very far from uh, circuits. Typically, when you did do this test, sometimes you can see the leaky the signals that you have in the environment of your laboratory. For example, typically 100 megahertz from FM broadcasting or things like that. No, so let's switch on my circuit. I am going to show you the circuit in just a minute. Okay, the circuit is here. Uh, uh, Okay, let's see, where is the camera here, back here, okay. You can see here the circuit. The circuit has a microcontroller, a crystal to create the clock of the microcontroller. I have a display, I have a connector where I am uh, powering with five volts using these wires here. The LED is on, the display is on, so the circuit is working now. So the idea is if I am interested in finding some specific frequency, I go with the near field probe close to the circuit uh oh, sorry, something is not connected now. What happened? Let me see what is not connected. Let me change the probe, perhaps. Okay, what happened? Oh, sorry, let me let me go to the. This is the input. Let me change the cable. This cable was working before, but perhaps there is some problem with the cable. Okay. I'm going to replace the cable with another 50 ohms cable. And let me see if I can see something now. Oh, something is working wrong. Okay, let me do this. Re 
press it again press it let me go to spectrum analyzer mode start frequency 10 megahertz oh sorry start frequency 10 megahertz stop frequency 200 megahertz and resolution bandwidth is manually is 2 megahertz okay so why the, the, the what what happened here i don't know arturo maybe you can uh, remove the internal attenuator because it's set to no, 15 dB. yes but this is the one possibility but uh, i was uh, testing it with the internal attenuator and there was okay. not a problem let me remove the attenuation good suggestion no it's is the preamp is off and okay. the manual is not a no, this is not a problem it's something i have some problem with the connection sorry let me try let me try another nuclear probe okay something is wrong here what is wrong i am connected to the good input port yes i don't know yes i tested it some time before the presentation okay oh let me try another this is the demo effect this is typical with my students let me see if i can work with another probe so i can identify the problem is with the probes if the problem is not with the cable perhaps the problem is with the probe okay okay it's not with the probe i don't know what happened here. Arturo, we just had a comment saying that's engineering for you. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. I don't know what is failing here. Okay, let me start frequency 10 megahertz, stop frequency, but this is so easy. So there is nothing special I am doing. Manually 2 megahertz of the resolution bandwidth. And now we connect the probe. And nothing. What? Ah, it's, it's not connected to the instrument. So I don't know what is. Uh, ah, now, now it looks like something is internal. Let me resolution bandwidth uh, one megahertz. Okay, okay. Now I start to see something. Let me go to the amplitude menu, and let's out to scale. Okay, now it's okay. Sorry for the for the problem i don't know what happened but at the end i was able to work with the same probe well i am going to switch to the small probe so i in this way i will be able to show you more uh, uh, as, as frequency resolution spatial resolution sorry so let me switch to let me go around the circuit you can see here that i can identify a specific energy as some frequencies okay if i move the probe around the circuit I am able to see how the amplitudes are going up or going down, depending on where is the activity I am picking up. Remember, the signal that you are picking up with the probe is proportional, it's, in, it's a voltage that is proportional to the derivative of current in your circuit. So you are looking at the derivative of current. If you have one scope, you can integrate, you will be able to see the current in your circuit. So when I uh, use a big loop, the energy I am able to pick up, look at this, is bigger. Let me change in the amplitude menu. Let's go to a scale of, uh, for example, 10 dB per division. Let me move the reference level, lowering. So you can see how is the uh, result in the spectrum analyzer. You can see that I identify some specific mountains, you know, some specific um, uh, envelopes of energy. What I know is that below these mountains, I have energy. Sometimes in broadband emissions, this mountain can be very broad. I don't know, 20, 30, 50, 60 megahertz in bandwidth. In EMC regulation, you cannot change the resolution bandwidth when, while you are measuring uh, in some kind of official uh, way. But in debugging, can be very useful. What happens if I change the resolution bandwidth? It is now in uh, the resolution bandwidth is, is now in uh, uh, one megahertz, 
so what happened if I change, for example, to 100 kilohertz? You will see that the noise level will be going down and we will be able to identify specifically uh, what kind of energy is below these mountains. So let's go to the manual. Let's go to a resolution bandwidth of 100 kilohertz here. And then you can see that because the noise level is reduced, I am able to identify signals that previously were not uh, easy to uh, see in the screen. No, so I can go start to go around the circuit. You can see that close to the connector, the activity of the harmonics of the clock are not very important. When I am on top of the display, there is no a very big activity. When I close to the uh, uh, integrated circuit to the microcontroller, the activity increase. When I am close to the uh, uh, clock circuit, the activity increase. And for example, when I am close to this lateral part of the PCB activity increase. This is dangerous because, for example, you can have some kind of cable in your product going close to this area and the noise that this is a part of the digital activity will be coupled by electric or magnetic field to this cable and this cable will be the antenna that uh, creates problems in the far field at three meters. So this noise for me is not very, very interesting. Let me change the probe to a smaller loop probe something like this, and let me fix in place so I am not changing the position or the orientation with my hand, okay? So you can see here that the, let me see if I can increase the size of the picture, okay, this way. And you can see that now the probe is close to the area where I can identify some specific activity. Let me see, okay. It's very, very small activity, let me see. Okay, this way in this area, and then let me, it's very small, let me go to the bigger loop. Okay, this way. Okay, you can see, and let me go to the menu, let me make an auto scale. Let me go to the uh, uh, marker menu, and with the marker, let's go to the peak. You can see that the peak of my emission is in 11.05 megahertz. This is the main frequency of my clock. Okay, you can see that in my PCB, the crystal here is 11.06 megahertz, 11.0592 megahertz. So this is the, the first harmonic of my clock. Sometimes, this is easy to understand because it's a digital circuit. Sometimes the problems are coming from a ringing or from a parasitic oscillation in your, in your circuit, and it's not easy to identify what is the origin of some specific frequency. So let's see what happens if I introduce a change in my circuit. I am going to introduce more decoupling capacitance in the microcontroller circuit. Look, look at the first harmonic and the second and the third harmonic, and look at the reduction of the amplitudes. Okay, so with this, uh, with this small capacitor in place, the capacitor I have introduced here, I'm going perhaps something like five or six dBs below the activity I have without the decoupling capacitor. Let me remove the decoupling capacitor. Bloop. And then you see this, the, act the activity is increasing. What means? With the decoupling capacitor in place here, I am reducing the activity in this area. So with NIFIR probes, you are able to test how different changes are uh, dominant or are important in the emissions in the near field or in the far field of your circuit. So what I am going to do now is to switch to some kind of uh, different activity. I will be using the field fox with one scanner. What kind of scanners we can find in the market? Two different scanners. One scanner where you have a near-field probe that is uh, uh, um, fixed to a one-arm robot, and automatically you sweep the area of interest uh, scanning in some specific frequency range, or you can use a flat scanner. The idea is this, basically the same for all of these products. Typically, you connect the EM probe, the one-arm robot, to the spectrum analyzer. In my case, I will be using the Fox, and both systems are connected to the software in the uh, uh, computer. If we go to the flat scanner, what we have is a, is a surface with more than 1,000 small loops that are uh, prepared to scan the different orientation of currents in your PCB. 
So you are able to identify where is the current path for your signals, what is very, very important to control EMI. The setup is specifically the same. You connect the scanner to the spectrum analyzer and you connect both systems to the uh, software in the computer. What can you do with this kind of uh, uh, instrument? You can scan a full PCB, so you can identify hot areas, critical loops, current paths. You can identify sources of aggressive signals, especially useful when the source is a, um, uh, um, how to say, is a parasitic oscillation or a ringing. You can identify where you have leakage if you put on top of the scanner some kind of enclosure, something that is very important especially for radiated emission in hundreds of megahertz. And then you can test cables. When testing cables, important things are differential currents, common mode currents. You can be interested in testing how is the effect of a ferrite, what kind of ferrite, how many times in, around the ferrite. With this kind of test, you can evaluate how is the uh, efficiency, or you can evaluate the shielding effect. This shielding versus the other shielding, connected at one end, connected at both ends, this kind of test can be easily done. This is what I will be doing in the second part of the demo. I will try to go fast to, to be on time for the question and answers. Okay, so remember we, we have the, the field fox connected in the same way, but now instead of connecting a near free probe, you are interested in some additional demo during the question and answers time. We can repeat any of the tests that you could be interested in. And let me connect now to the FieldFox, the output from the scanner. So the measurements will be done by the FieldFox, and the scanner is sending the information from the loops to the spectrum analyzer. My product is on. Let me switch on so you can see that the display is on. And then what I am going is to activate the area of interest for my scan. Remember the idea of the near field probe close to the edge of the PC board. Okay, so let me see if I open the EM viewer software. Let's go to the EM viewer software. Okay, this is the software that will be used to control the field fox and the scanner. Okay, they are connected yet. You can see connected to a scanner and a spectrum analyzer. Let me uh, create an spectral analysis. That means what? I'm going to scan the device under test with the field fox in some specific frequency range. For example, from 10 megahertz up to, I don't know, 300 megahertz. Let's go, we can go here up to eight gigahertz. We can specify some specific resolution bandwidth. I will be using 120 kilohertz. Remember, with a, a smaller bandwidth, you will be faster in the sweep of the analysis. I'm not going to measure peaks. With the measurement of peaks, you can do a specific measurement of uh, a number of peaks that are of interest for you. No? For example, you put here five, you will obtain the uh, five most important emissions from the product. Then you specify the spectral scan probes. I am interested in scanning below this area from column P to AF and from row six to 16. No? So Let's select known, and then I can specify this area. This is one possibility. I can go and I can select this area for uh, my interest. But for the spectral scan, uh, uh, scan, this is not necessary. You can scan, I don't know, in the corners, for example. This is the corners of my PC board. And for example, in some specific areas, uh, points below the device under test, no? Because I am not interested in finding where this energy is now, I am interested in finding what frequencies I have here. Let me spe spe specify the measurement of peaks. Let's obtain, I don't know, the, the three more important peaks in my analysis, okay? Then I can introduce some uh, gain if you are using an uh, external amplifier or something like that. Let me go to run the test, okay? So I'm going to run the test only one time, you can run continuously, so you can make uh, 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 changes, I don't know, in the software or in some specific value of a component. You can see here the activity that I have below the uh, PCB. Let me uh, uh, increase the size of the screen so you can see better. Okay, 
this one and then okay this way so we can see perfectly the frequency spectrum you can see that below my pcb i have a specific activity at the uh, 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 odd harmonics of the clock you know? this is uh, 11 this is 33 55 77 i have some uh, fm broadcasting activity and the other harmonics are uh, seriously reduced you no know? so i am interested in finding for example where is this activity the 11 megahertz is the frequency that we detected in the edge of the PC board. So I'm going to run a node that is called a spatial node. From the spatial node, I select what frequency is of interest for me. For example, let's specify from the three peaks I have detected, 11.06 is the first harmonic of my clock. 120 kilohertz for the resolution bandwidth. And instead of this setup for activated cells, let's go here to activate all the cells below the device under test because i am interested now in finding where the 11 megahertz signal is located in my circuit no amplitude adjustment accept i increase the size of the screen and i run the test now i am not running the test at one specific frequency i am running the test only at 11 megahertz so you can see where is the loops in my circuit clearly i can see that around the pc the microcontroller one of the decoupling capacitors and the area of the crystal i have activity of 11 megahertz in red color is the most uh, uh, the biggest amplitude but i can identify that in the edge of the board i have serious activity no i have uh, some kind of amplitude like i can compare with the situation if I introduce the decoupling capacitor. Sometimes it's useful here to introduce a picture or the silk screen of your design. You know? For example, let me introduce the uh, silk screen for this device. Okay, where is the file? This one. And I can go here. I can rotate mirror. I can rotate. I can put this in place. So this is the picture of my, uh, you can introduce here instead of the silk screen, you can introduce a picture that you can take with your phone. So it's easier for me to find exactly where is the uh, activity of the current. You can see that here you will be able to identify that I have in the PCB a big trace that is a ground trace that is going around the PCB. It's a two layers PCB. Let's go to the uh, to run the test now, the same test, but with a decoupling capacitor in place. So we put the capacitor in place. Remember how with the near field probes, we were able to see the reduction in the edge of the PC board. So let's run the test again, and then we will compare. No? So this measurement is the without the capacitor, and this second test is with the decoupling capacitor. To be able to compare, I am going to specify the same scale. I'm going to remove the auto scale setup. So auto scale is off. Let me put here from minus 26 to 32 or 31. Okay, minus 25 is easier to remember. From minus 25 to 31. Let's put here. No, this is the. The, the picture in colors from minus 25 to 31. So I go to the measurement with the decoupling capacitor and I specify the same scale from minus 25 to 31. And this is the difference, okay? If you want, we can go to a different scale to identify easier how is the difference, okay? In color. It's very clear that when I introduce the decoupling capacitor, the activity of 11 megahertz is around this area and is not so important to the, in this area and it's not important in the area where I have the connector. So the decoupling capacitor is working better. I have more control of where the transient of my circuit are and I have here the, pre, the um, initial situation with my instrument. I can see this in 3D. This is very useful. So you can see how the activity is around this area of the PCB. 
you can rotate or you can take a picture for documentation. Okay, is the same with cables or with the is the same with enclosure. So let me show you a last experiment where instead of this PCB, I will be using a small box where I will be creating some internal activity. No, the circuit inside of this enclosure is powered by a battery, nine volts battery. So let's go here. Let's put here the enclosure. In the opposite side of this of this system, I have the same slots that I have in the top of the box. So we will be able to see what happened if some harmonics find a good path for these uh, frequencies, no? for the frequencies I have internally in this uh, device. Okay. So what I need to do is, for example, some kind of uh, analysis instead of a spectral or a spatial scan, let's run a spectral a spatial scan. Let's uh, specify a frequency range that, for example, goes from 10 megahertz up to 300 megahertz. And let's go to a resolution bandwidth of 300 kilohertz. I am going to sweep in this frequency range and now because the scan is called spectral spatial. What I am going to do is to scan all the cells that are below this area and in the full frequency range. Let me go from the row six to row 20 and from P to AI. So from P to AI. Okay, AI exactly here to 20. This is the area of interest for me. Yeah, I can introduce the overlay, of course. I can go here and I can go to introduce a picture I have taken with my phone so we can find exactly where are the slots in my enclosure. Okay, accept, and then I can run the test. Remember, what I am doing now is to scan the full picture, the full uh, area of below the uh, enclosure. You can see that I start to see activity at some harmonics. Eh? I have a, a, some leakage through the apertures of the cover and the body of the enclosure in the laterals. So it's not very slow, it's uh, fast because I am sweeping a lot of cells in a big frequency range with a small uh, resolution bandwidth. Okay, you can start to see the, how these green colors will be switching to blue colors as the system is finding higher amplitudes in this area. No? So it's clear that in this area here, I have some frequency that is coming out. Okay, so let's increase the size of the screen this way. And then we can put a mouse on top of the cells and you can see that the frequency that is going out is the harmonics of 300 megahertz, basically. Okay, of course we have additional uh, frequencies going out. No, if I go here, this frequency here, this peak is a frequency of 200 megahertz. So I can go to the user composite view and I can say where you have found this peak. Uh, this peak is here too, but it's bigger, the peak of 300 megahertz. No, this is what we say, what we see here. Okay. Again, sorry, reset zoom. What we can do here is to increase the differences to see how is the emission from the leakage, or we can see the 3D view to pick up the area specifically where we have the problem. No, So in this case, for example, you have some cables or you have some uh, aggressive area in your PCB, perhaps moving the PCB to the area that is not below the uh, slots, you will be able to reduce the emissions using these slots, or perhaps you can take the decision to reduce the size of the length of the um, ventilation uh, area, no? And this is a general view of uh, measuring with the near field tools is a short webinar. So I hope we, we are able to cover the main ideas, but remember that this is a world of experiments and problems for all of you. So I will be happy to answer any question you can have, or we can repeat any, any other 
uh, experiment that can be of interest for you. Cornell, I think Thanks it's... very much, Arturo. That was great. Thank you, Pierre. Um, so if anybody's got any questions for either of the presenters, for Pierre or Arturo, um, we can do that now. Um, I don't have anything in the chat function at the moment. Um, somebody's just asked if they could get the presentation. So just to let everybody know that um, all of you will receive the recording of the webinar as well as the presentation of both presenters. Um, so that will go out to everybody. Um, so if we have any questions, uh, you can ask them now or post them in the chat, please. No questions? No, nope, no questions. Looks like uh, you guys did an extremely good job. <laughs> I hope, I hope. <laughs> okay. Pleasure. Great. Well, then I'll end the presentation then. So, uh, Pierre, thank you very much to you and everybody in Keysight. Really appreciate um, the time and the effort that you've put into this webinar. Uh, Professor Arturo, same to you. As always, thank you very much My for pleasure. taking part in this webinar. Um, to everybody else, if you need any further information on anything that was covered today, please get in touch. Um, we will make sure that it goes to the right person. So thank you very much for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a happy Christmas and uh, we will hopefully see you all in the new year. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, Pierre.